motion, sir. Recognize the member for St. Peter. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, beautiful, lovely presentation by the Honorable Attorney General. What a tangle of web we weave, Mr. Speaker, when we practice to deceive. Lovely flowery words, beautiful presentation. My question to the Honorable Attorney General is how we have arrived here. Give us the historical context of what exactly was the purpose of this act, Mr. Speaker, in light of the Privy Council judgment. And one can understand, you know, Mr. Speaker, the establishment of a criminal prosecution service. I have no, absolutely no difficulty with the establishment of a criminal prosecution services. You have the Crown Prosecution Service, the CPS in the United Kingdom, and there's nothing wrong with a CPS here, headed by the Director of Public Prosecution, the DPP, Mr. Speaker, to include police prosecutors whose power to institute prosecutions of, let's say, summary convictions, offenses, which is provided in the Police Act. But, Mr. Speaker, this piece of legislation that we are proposing to be passed here today and we are seeking to amend today, the criminal prosecution presentation, the Criminal Prosecution Service Act, Mr. Speaker, was originally passed in 2017. But, Mr. Speaker, it only came into force in 2021 some four years later. Mr. Speaker, I want to ask the Attorney General, why did it take four years for this act to come into effect? Pardon me? Well, then fund, fund the office with resources. But the 2017 Act, Mr. Speaker, of the Criminal Prosecution Services Act, quite significantly removes the power all of the powers of the police to institute criminal proceedings without the written approval of the DPP. And if we look at section 27.2 of the Criminal Proceedings, Prosecution, sorry, Service Act, number 28 of 2017, it's clear and it is unambiguous. Sir. And I quote, despite the provisions of any law in force in Antigua and Barbuda and subject to subsection one, no public officer shall, after the commencement of this act, institute any criminal proceedings or undertake the prosecution of any criminal case in any court unless he's authorized so to do in writing by the DPP end of court. And that essentially is what brings us here today, Mr. Speaker. Following a recent High Court decision to nullify a charge filed in the High Court against a police officer, without the approval of the DPP. The criminal justice in Antigua and Barbuda, and I said so this morning, Mr. Attorney General, is now in a huge mess. And the Attorney General must take full responsibility, Mr. Speaker, for that mess that we find ourselves in. And we are, and with absolutely no remorse on the part of the Attorney General for the incompetence the inefficiency on his part, and no sense of shame, Mr. Speaker. Absolutely no sense of shame for the dishonorable conduct. Mr. Speaker, I don't wish to be disturbed. Instead of resigning in any civil society, he would have tendered his resignation. He would have tendered his resignation in the public interest. But he comes to this honorable house, Mr. Speaker, Instead of resigning, he's seeking an amendment to the act because, and he quotes in the explanatory memorandum, the rationale because of certain recent developments which show that it's not practical for the police to always obtain the written authority of the DPP to charge an individual. What diplomatic language you're couching it in. He needs to resign. He needs to resign. It is a shame. That's what you all need to march the Governor General about. Not calling for a commission of inquiry. Because the Governor General have no authority to call no commission of inquiry. 
Presently, Mr. Speaker, there are a number of cases that have been thrown out and many of the charges must be filed within six months of the offence and it can't be refiled. So while this bill seeks to be retroactively validating all of those serious injustices that took place since November 2021 and in 2023 we have a spate of unlawful detentions, unlawful arrests, unlawful prosecutions, unlawful penalties, unlawful imprisonment, awaiting legal redress, and you say that the criminal system is not in a mess, comprised by reckless self-serving conduct in the governance of the government of this country, and it's business as usual, as nothing has happened, Mr. Speaker. Point of order, Mr. Speaker. I am not yielding. Point of Is order. it a point of order? Pardon me? Sit down, it's a point of order. Okay. Nobody's speaking to you. The Prime rules Minister. are specific. You are an experienced politician. Do not read even the little boy better than you. I am <laughs> you not. don't read the thing. I am not. Stop reading. I am not. Don't don't be spurious today. Close it. Close it. Don't be spurious. Furious. Let us deal with the facts of how we arrived here today. I, uh, thank you for Let that, us deal with the Privy Council and may the I context. Be, may I no, be allowed yes, to sorry. rule on the point of order? Yes, sure. I apologize. The point of order is correct. You read this morning and you're reading now. I just couldn't be bothered this morning. You, you read on your prompter there. You read it and you know it's against the rules, and you continue to do it because you don't care about the rules. Mr. Speaker. And if you continue to, to read, I only have one alternative. Mr. Speaker, I'm referring to my copious notes. No, no, no. And I seek your permission. <laughs> well, that's very I creative. I seek your permission. This very is a creative. very important... Let me say That my is piece. very creative. Mr. Speaker. You are reading your Mr. speech. Mr. Speaker. Stop reading your speech. With the greatest speech. respect to you, sir. I seek your permission. The standing orders allows me to seek your permission to refer to my copious notes of my research. And I have also brought the judgment here of the Privy Council. I have also brought a number of cases filed in the High Court, which I would like to refer to, that were thrown out recently. And I seek your permission, which I will share all of them with the Honorable House. Please, Mr. Speaker. All, you don't do not need, take away from my First minutes, of all, you do not need the Speaker's permission to refer to notes. The standing orders do not speak to copious notes. It speaks to just a note, notes. So while that's very creative, that is not correct. You may read certain parts of the judgment, the matter for you. But you continue to read from your device, and if you can, I am warning you there's been a proper point of order, and I'm ruling on the point of order that you're reading. And I take exception to the fact that I've spoken to you on at least three or four occasions, and you continue to do it. Well, the book stops today. You will not read the, anything from that device other than a line note. But, but I can read from the judgment of the Privy Council. Read to, to the, you may read from the judgments or any particular works. Thank you, sir. And I also can read from other judgments of the High Court. You want me to shut my device? Shut it down. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. That will re remove the Excellent, temptation. Excellent, Mr. Speaker. You would like the device? Don't make yourself a clown. So let me refer to the judgment of the Privy Council, Mr. Speaker. I crave your indulgence. I crave your indulgence, Mr. Speaker, 
I hope I'll get back my last five minutes. I crave your indulgence, the court, from the judgment, Mr. Speaker. Let me find the right judgment delivered. Oh, I have it here. On the 16th of April, 2014, by Lord Wilson and Mr. Speaker, Lord Wilson, the Privy Council, judgment. Pardon me? Oh, the name of the case, you should know it. It is your case, Commissioner of Police and another appellant, Stadroy C.O. Benjamin, respondent from the Court of Appeal of Antigua and Barbuda. You appealed. <laughs> and that's why I said you have no, absolutely no remorse or no shame. And that's how we ended up here today, because I had to give the historical context of the passport picture when there was an issue where you certified an allegation, they didn't say allegation of a passport that once that Roy Benjamin certified a photograph of a Miss Brand. And the DPP advised the police, the time, Corporal O'Garro, I believe it was, not to charge you. And the police, Corporal Garro, I think now, is Inspector ASP O'Garro. He proceeded to charge you, despite the instructions of the DPP at the time. You insinuated and you allege that there was political interference by the then Minister of Justice and Attorney General, Mr. Justin Simon. And Colin Derrick. And Colin Derrick. And you said that you knew Ms. Mr. Brand for two years and that you also knew that the photograph that you were certifying was true to the best of your ability and you was not committing any fraud. I'm not, I'm not saying that you committed any fraud, Mr. Speaker. But if you did not know the photograph of Mr. Brand and you knew Mr. Brand or you whoever, but contrary to the instruction of the DPP, Mr. Speaker, not to bring charges against Mr. Benjamin, the police filed a criminal charge and I think it was on the 2nd of June, 2008, according to the Privy Council appeal, for the purpose of procuring an Antigua passport. In November 2008, Mr. Benjamin filed leave to apply for judicial review of the police complaints against you. Tell me if I'm wrong. You claim that in light of the instruction of the DPP not to prosecute you, that it was unlawful and you sought that the summons issued against you to be quashed. And as I just recently said, that you said that it was improper that the Attorney General and the Commission of Police was instructed by the Minister of Legal Affairs and Justice at the time, and there was political interference. The High Court held, however, that the DPP had absolutely no power to prevent the police from instituting criminal proceedings against you. You appealed it to the Eastern Caribbean Court of Appeal. You won at the Eastern Caribbean Court of Appeal. And then the Crown appealed it to the Privy Council. And then the Privy Council issued its judgment. And in the concluding paragraphs on page, well, paragraph 29, it says, with respect to the majority, and I quote, Mr. Speaker, in the Court of Appeal, the board concludes that the answer to question set out in paragraph one is a no. What is the question in paragraph one? The first paragraph one that the Privy Council considered was does the director of public prosecutions have a general power to prevent the police from instituting a criminal proceedings? The Privy Council judgment said no. And they quoted the famous Lord Denning, where he said in the case where the Crown versus Commissioner of Police of the Metropolitan Metropolis, ex Blackburn, 1968, Lord Denning said at page 136, and I quote, I hold it to be the duty of the Commissioner of Police of the Metropolis to enforce the law of the land. He must take steps 
shorter posts meant that crimes won't be detected and to, that honest citizens may go about their affairs in peace. He must decide whether or not suspected persons should be prosecuted and if need be, bring the prosecution or see that it is brought. And blah, blah, he continues. No can any police authority tell him so. He's answerable to the law and to the law alone. In paragraph 33, however, he says the board's conclusion does not disable it from stressing the importance of good mutual respectful working relationship between the police and the director. That's the director, the DPP. Unresolved conflict between them of the sort exemplified in this appeal damages public confidence in the administration of justice. So both of them must work together, both the police and the DPP. They must have a working mutual relationship. The director can generally be expected to have a wider perception in the police of whether, for example, a proposed prosecution is in the public interest. The director cannot instruct, but he can request. He cannot instruct the police. The police will be wise to tread with care before deciding to reject a request by the director not to institute proceedings. And in the very last paragraph of this Privy Council judgment, Mr. Speaker, it says, accordingly, the board will humbly advise Her Majesty that the appeal should be allowed. That is the appeal, the Crown, the government of Antigua and Barbuda appealed the Eastern Caribbean Appeal Court judgment that Mr. Cutie Benjamin won, that the orders of the Court of Appeal dated 19 September 2011 should be set aside with the result that the orders of the High Court dated 31st of July 2009 will again have effect, and that the respondent, that is the Honorable Cutie Benjamin, should pay the cost of the appellants and of incidental to the appeals to the Court of Appeal to the Board. My question is, I hope he has paid the cost into the Treasury of Antigua and Barbuda. Because finally, you know, the AG, Mr. Speaker, went on public radio and television and here in this parliament as well, claiming that the trial judge was wrong. He said the chief magistrate was correct, and in a bold statement, he got up in this honorable August House, and he said he would appeal the decision. The trial judge was wrong, and having realized the futility of appealing a correct interpretation of section 27, subsection 2 of the 2017 law, Member for he should definitely Mr. Member for St. Peter. Yes, sir. Thank you for your dissertation on the case. Now, can you kindly tell me what is the connection with that case and this bill? <coughs> well, I am saying to this Honorable House. Because if you don't, I'm asking you, please debate the bill. I am debating the bill. No, you're not. I am saying, Mr. Speaker, that the Honorable Attorney General has sought to come in the guise to this country to pass this bill to nullify the Privy Council. This is the relevance of why I'm quoting so at length, to nullify it. And I am saying that the Privy Council decision in the case of the Commissioner of Police versus Ted Roy Benjamin makes clear the distinct powers of the DPP and the Commissioner of Police, Mr. Speaker. And we cannot sweep that underneath the carpet. I am not saying that I am against a criminal prosecution service. I started out saying that we have it in England. There's nothing wrong with having it. You have to staff the office properly. You have to have officers trained properly. You have to have a memorandum of understanding between the police, the director of the public prosecution office. Where is the staffing going to come from? Where is the funding going to come from? All of those questions I would like to be answered. And I'm saying, you ask me what is the relevance? The relevance is, in effect, he's reversing the Privy Council in what can be considered a personal matter that the Attorney General of this country would argue before the very courts that the police should have absolutely no authority and power that he's taking it away from them. And he's making legislation retroactive. And I'm saying that is wrong. That is wrong, Mr. Mr. Speaker. And you want me to go to the bill, to the substance of the bill? No problem. 
absolutely no problem. If we look at the 2017 Act, in the explanatory memorandum to start out with, the bill recognizes, Mr. Speaker, and it's worded, as I said, in diplomatic language. The amendment is occasioned, the Quaid says that, is occasioned by certain recent developments which show that it's not practical for the police to always obtain the written authority of the DPP. The big question I have for the Attorney General is how does that decision affect the many convictions by magistrates in this country of persons charged for criminal offenses? How? By the police without the written authority of the DPP since 2017. How? What are we going to do? We're going to tell all of those people who have been charged, all of those people that are up in the prison, that they were charged wrongfully. We're going to free them. We're going to retry them. That is the embarrassing position that we, or rightly, the government finds itself in today. And that is the reality. What next? Honorable Attorney General, what next? What next? Honorable Prime Minister, where do we go from here? I mean, the, the Attorney General became Attorney General in 2014. His charges were mysteriously dropped. But back to the bill. Deleting the word all in section three, which outlines the purpose of the act, is commendable, Mr. A.G. As neither the DPP nor the criminal prosecution should have the sole right to institute and under undertake all criminal proceedings. So I agree with you on that point. And the police also has a duty, as Lord Denning said, to do so. And this must be recognized. The police has a duty, Mr. Speaker. Section 12, amending Section 12, to include the words, and in any case in which he or she considers it proper to do so, is correct. As Section 88 in the Constitution uses the exact words, Mr. Speaker, in defining the powers and functions of the DPP, thereby allowing him a discretion rather than an absolute obligation. Section, amending Section 12 by repealing Subsection A, which gives the DPP overall conduct in criminal proceedings in Antigua and Barbuda, is again the correct thing to do. As the power clearly conflicts with the Constitution, our supreme law, which does not give the DPP that overall power. So I agree with you, Mr. A.G., to repeal that section. Repealing Section 23 and the schedule provides for an oath of affirmation of office to be taken by the DPP and the staff that was totally unnecessary in the first place, in light of the normal function of persons before the passing of this act. The other amendment, which I see here, is Section 27, the transitional provisions, Mr. Speaker, which addresses transitional position of police prosecutors and public officers who continue in duties have been affected by coming into force of the act, I don't think we really need that provision because the act, <laughs> um, I suggest that the entire section should be repealed given the date that it's coming into effect now, four years after. So I don't think we even need that section. But inserting a new section of 27A which will prevent public officers for example, like in the Revenue Department or the Customs Department, from instituting any criminal proceedings unless authorized to do so by the DPP. I only hope that the criminal prosecution service will be sufficiently staffed, I said so. Unfunded, unfunded, Mr. A.G. Because they will be required to carry an additional burden. And. Uh, I also note in the act that it does speak to the appointment of police prosecutors, 
which allow for training and supervision pursuant to Section 15 of the Act. But I wonder why, Mr. A.G., in Section 4.2, the Cabinet is to determine any additional staff to be employed in that office. Why the Cabinet? In my view, that is total political interference. It shouldn't be the Cabinet. It should be, you know, the DPP as the head of the unit. I mean, you don't want it to be seen, or the perception is greater than reality in these things, that the cabinet is having unnecessary political interference, especially given the very sensitive nature of these officers' duties, you know. But all in all, I cannot support the bill which is seeking to retrospectively validate incomp incompetent inefficiency on the part of the Attorney General. I cannot especially while people, Mr. Speaker, remains up in the prison, remanded unlawfully, as this bill is being presently debated in this House today. It is not right, it is not just. It is absolutely absurd. And, uh, you know, since the High Court ruled recently, and I can't say the nature of the offense because it's against the law to say it, but um, I think it was it was Wendell Robinson who took the, court, the case um, to court and the uh, High Court threw it out. And then uh, we have to refile it, etc. The AG is now trying to give validity to the nullified charges retrospectively. That can't be right. Absolutely wrong. And, you know, many people have been jailed and convicted from nullified charges because police arrest them without getting prior authorization from the DPP. So what is going to happen to all those people? It's not the police fault. You can't blame the police. You have to blame the Attorney General and he not bringing into effect the law four years later. It is a serious matter, you know. Speak to the criminal lawyers. Go and speak to them. Speak to the bar. Ask them, you are a legal luminary, you practice criminal law in this country for over 40 years, maybe 50, maybe more. Mr. Speaker, it's not asset Michael getting up here and grandstanding. I speak my conscience, I just voted for the acquisition of the cancer center because I think it's the right thing to do. I agree with the opposition that I do not know why it's at the last hour that they're doing it. But of course they have to come back to acquire it. How else are they going to go and negotiate with a new investor? <laughs> so I'm not going to block the government from the progress and I have constituents and the Antigans and Barbudans out there that need chemotherapy and need to be treated. But when you have a serious matter like this, where the AG thinks by the stroke of a pen he can use the parliament because he's the attorney general of this country, to upturn and turn over a Privy Council ruling and bring a law to this house and you have people sitting in prison that the police have arrested because you passed the law and said that they must get the written authority of the DPP and they've not gotten it because the officers are properly functioning, no staff is in there, no training is taking place. Nothing has been placed in the budget for four years. And in any other civilized society, you will be made to be resigned or fired. And you come to this honorable house with your sweet sounding words and flowery presentation. And we accept it. And it's business as usual. It's wrong. You and then we talk about good governance in this country, and transparency, and the Prime Minister imputes improper motives about me. You have... I have never been charged of no criminal offence. You were charged. You have two minutes more. And I can ask now for 30 minutes more. You what? I can ask for permission. No, no... I know no. you will not give me, but well, you, you were charged criminally, and you sat, and the question this honourable house was asked, why were those criminal charges withdrew?
Member and, for and upon whose instructions were those criminal charges withdrawn? Member for St. Peter. I take my seat. You take, Justice must be served in this country. Your seat. You must resign. Or oh, you too, the Prime Minister, must resign. You're presiding over corruption. 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 You're presiding over. And so are you. And so are you a thief. Where did you get your millions from? Answer that. You answer that. You answer that to this country. You had no money. Not a cent. Not a dollar you had. Your checks were bouncing. For further performance. Right? Hold on, I just want to admit, maybe I don't know the rules. I'm supposed that somebody can ask for more time. Not on bills. Not on this bill. 30 minutes. 30 minutes. And he can ask more, but you have to ask properly. And he can't demand it. Can't, I'm not talking to you, bro. I'm speaking to the Honourable Member for me. I am speaking... Uh -huh. You see... Uh,